A young boy I knew was terribly afraid of water. As a toddler, what happened is he'd fallen into a pond and put near drown. And from that point on, he was just terrified of it, plumb scared of water. And so when he turned four or so, his dad decided it was time for him to get over it. But he was still afraid of water. So sometimes you hear these horror stories about dad taking the kid out to the end of the dock and just dropping him off, and it was sink or swim. But that didn't happen with this little boy. His dad loved his son. And so what he did is he started off by having his son hang on to him around his neck like a piggyback. Then he'd swim around with him on the top, not going under the water and all that, until the boy thought, well, that isn't so bad. That's kind of fun. And then his dad would tell him, all right, we're going to go under for just a sec, so hold your breath. And he'd just barely go under and come right back up again before the kid gets scared. He kept doing that, and over time, you know, I mean, this didn't all happen one day, but over time, the kid finally realized, hey, that's kind of fun, too. So he said, right, we're going to go down a little longer and hold on and whatnot. And then uh, one day, eventually, he told the little boy, all right, you're not going to hang on to me anywhere. You can do a little swimming on your own, but don't worry. I'll be right here. I'll hang on to you. Nothing bad's going to happen to you and so forth. Of course, at first, that was real scary, too. But after a while, the little boy uh, got used to what was going on and got to the point where he didn't need his dad right there next to him. And finally, somewhere in this whole process, the fear left him. He never won a medal or anything, but he, he learned how to swim. He's not scared of the water anymore. What happened was that the love and trust he had in his dad, that absolute confidence the little boy had that as long as his dad was right there close by, nothing really bad could happen to him, nothing really serious was going to hurt him, that love and confidence gave that little boy the power or the ability to deal with the situation that at least for him was really terrifying. And all that brings me around to what's actually the most important point of tonight's conference and in fact the whole mission. What's the most important point of the conference and the whole mission? is the love the sacred heart has for us. The love our Lord has for us. See, just like that knowledge that the little boy had of the reality of the love and care and closeness of his dad gave the little guy so much confidence and so much security that it gave him an ability to overcome his fears, overcome his terror and worries, and learn how to swim. So also the knowledge each one of us has of the love and care and closeness that the sacred ha- heart has to us, the clo- how close he is, how much he loves us, that should give us all confidence and give us security. It can give each one of us to overcome whatever fears or worries we have, whatever problems we're having in life, no matter what kind of crosses God has decided to place on us, okay? So we don't ever want to forget the love the sacred heart has for us. That love, he's burning with love for each of us. That's why in the artwork, of course, it shows his heart like it's on outside his chest. That's just artwork. His heart was glowing with so much love that it's shining through his chest. It's incandescent with the flames of his love for man. That's why he became man. He didn't do that for the angels. He did it for us. Why did he become man? Because he loves us. Why did he suffer and die on the cross? Because he loves us. Why did he give his mother to watch over us. Because he loves us. Why did he establish the Holy Catholic Church? Because he loves us. Why is he sitting there right now in the tabernacle? Because he loves us. Why does he come to us in Holy Communion? Because he loves us. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need to be in the tabernacle. He doesn't need to come to Holy Communion to us. We need him. And he puts himself at our mercy, in our disposal, this is the good God that can do everything. And he puts, he humbles himself so much that he becomes a piece of food. And even if we're not properly disposed, even if, God forbid, we were to make a sacrilegious communion, he still humbles himself so much that at that point in time, he give a person the time to repent, huh? He hasn't left us orphans. He loves us. He's right here. He's alive. He's alive and he loves us. And the question is, do we love him? Do we trust him? What the sacred heart wants for each one of us is to have that absolute profound trust and confidence for him, a love for him, the knowledge, the confidence that he's close to us, an absolute confidence that he's right here, he's watching over us, he loves us, and he wants to give each one of us such a profound love for him, such a profound confidence in him, that we can deal with any situation no matter how terrifying it might seem to someone else. He doesn't want us to panic. He doesn't want us to chicken little. Even 
if he puts us in a time when the sky is falling, we don't have to do the chicken little routine. God loves us. He wants us to become saints. He'll send us whatever graces we need to deal with our particular circumstances. As long as we strive to hold up our end of the deal by staying in the state of grace, by keeping the commandments, by doing our duty in our state of life. Huh? What matters is that our Lord loves us. He loves us. And if he put us in particular circumstances, it's not a surprise to him. It might surprise us, but it's not a surprise to him. And he wants us to become saints in those particular circumstances. Now, that being said, let's get started. Back home in Montana, when we see moon dogs or sun dogs, it's a sign that something's on the way. Okay, Father, what's a moon dog or what's a sun dog, and what are they a sign of? Well, first off, at least back home, moon dogs and sun dogs are fairly common optical phenomena. They might be here in Kansas, but I don't get outside a lot so uh, and, and, and check the weather like I should. But anyway, sometimes when we look up at the moon or the sun, we can see kind of a halo that's surrounding them, or maybe just parts of a halo. There's the sun or the moon, and there's two little curves off to each side, right at either side. And then right on the side of the halo or that little curve on each side, right on each one there's a bright light right here on the, right there. So, for example, you'd have the moon and a light there and a light there. That would be a moon dog, and that would be the other moon dog. Or you'd have the sun, and that bright light would be the uh, sun dog, and there would be another sun dog, okay? Sometimes there will be a whole halo, sometimes only be a curve. And you'll see those real bright lights. And those are called moon dogs or sun dogs. When we see moon dogs or sun dogs, and like I say, they're pretty common, it's a sign that something's on the way. See, those moon dogs or those sun dogs are produced by moonlight or sunlight that are passing through ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. So there's cirrus, there's cirrus stratus clouds way up there, which means it's this warm front that's coming off the Pacific Ocean. And those clouds that produce those moon dogs or sun dogs are the very lead edge, the very thin wedge on the very front of that warm front. The way a warm front works is you have a mass of cold air, and the warm air comes off the ocean, but because it's warmer and it's less dense, it starts sliding up over that cold air to so get a really long, thin wedge. So you have really high in the front that's real thin, and then as you go back towards the Pacific, it, it, it gets fatter and fatter till it's finally on the ground over here. And it's moving this way. See, it, it's moving from the west to the east is, is what's coming on. The west winds there. So anyway, right there in that lead edge of the wedge is where those zero or zero stratus clouds are they, that have the ice crystals that cause those moon dogs or sun dogs. So they're on the lead edge way up there, maybe five or six hundred miles away. That warm front is sitting on the ground. It might, it might just, just it'd still be on the Pacific. It might just be rolling off the Pacific, you know. So it, 500, 600 miles away is in the middle of Washington somewhere. Anyway. What's there, if you go down, the, the, you go zero, zero stratus, it goes down, and pretty soon you get to nimbo stratus. Because what it means is in a couple days you're going to have weather. Might be rain, might be snow, but you're going to have weather. You're going to get some precipitation. So that's it. When we see them, we go, oh, we, a few days we've got rain. We know that. It's an absolute sign. Once we know what the sign means, we know what's going to happen. Anybody can do it. You see, look up there and see it. Like I said, I don't know how the weather works here, but at home you see them, you go, there's going to be weather, and it'll be there. Okay? Nothing new. People have been doing it since the beginning. Our Lord spoke of predicting the weather by reading the signs in the sky. In fact, not only did he speak of predicting the weather by reading the signs in the heavens, he actually castigated the Jews. Why? Because they were able to read the signs in the heaven, what was going to happen in the weather, but they were unable to read the signs, the times. Quote, this is our Lord, quote, You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret signs of the times. Close quote. And when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the pleasant time? Close quote. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Why do you not know how to interpret the signs of the times? Let us that question not be asked of us. Tonight, we're going to spend some time considering a few of the signs of the times. We'll start by looking at signs in the church and signs in our society. Then we'll spend a few minutes considering what those signs ought to mean to us, okay? Now, through the whole conference, the quotes have been abbreviated, cut and pasted to save time. I've added my own editorial comments and so forth and so forth. 
All right, let's start by considering the signs of time in the church. Now, obviously, you don't need to come here to, to, to have me tell you that the state of the church is an absolute catastrophe. I mean, it's a wreck. It's a disaster of biblical proportions, okay? We already know that. But what we want to do is focus in a little more closely. And what we're going to do to start off is focus on attitudes and beliefs of the Catholic laity. Not because I'm a priest and want to pick on the laity and so forth, but because we have the data. We, ha- we have the data, number one. And number two, frankly, I think that for the most part, the laity are far more conservative than the clergy. So if what we see in the laity, if it's a bad, it's going to be worse than the clergy. That's how it works, Okay. Well, this part, there will be some numbers and all that. It's just in the beginning. Don't worry, because then we'll analyze it later. But I don't want to think, you sit here and I'm going to do statistics all night. No way. But we need to get some hard data, and we'll go from there, okay? So let's get started with our first sign. Our first sign is the beliefs of Catholic elementary school religion teachers, all right? survey was taken. Uh, well, it was published in 2000. It's probably taken in 99. It summarizes the beliefs of religion teachers in Catholic elementary schools. The beliefs of Catholic elementary school religion teachers. The percentage of lay religion teachers in Catholic elementary schools who identify the church's position on the following issues with their own. Church's position with their own. Now, remember, this information is already almost a decade old. Percentage of religion teachers in Catholic elementary schools who identify the church's position in artificial birth control of their own is 10%. 10% of Catholic elementary school religion teachers agree with infallible teaching of the church in regards to birth control. In other words, 90% of religion teachers in Catholic elementary schools are not Catholic. 90% of religion teachers in Catholic elementary schools belong to a different religion. That's the first statistic. That's the first thing we notice. Elective abortion, 26%. 26% of Catholic elementary school religion teachers agree with infallible teaching of the church in regards to abortion. In other words, 74% disagree. These are religion teachers. Infallibility of the Pope. We're making some progress now. 27%. Given the first two statistics, the fact that only 27% of the Catholic elementary schools believe the Pope is infallible shouldn't come as a big surprise. Euthanasia, 31%. The male priesthood, 33%. Indissolubility of marriage, 54%. The real presence in the Eucharist, 68%. Now we're getting somewhere. I don't know what the other 32% believe in. Divinity of Jesus, 91%. So roughly 10% of Catholic Religion school elementary teachers don't believe Jesus is God. So let's summarize this section really quick. What have we seen so far? Even if we grant a generous margin of error to the results, we could still characterize these results as symptomatic of profound apostasy and dissent from infallible teachings, especially the infallible moral teachings of the Catholic Church. And remember, this is among religion teachers in Catholic elementary schools. That's outrageous, but surely it must be better in the pews. Sign. We'll check the attitudes in the pews by taking a few minutes to consider some statistics, which for the most part were reported recently in the new Oxford Review. So these are by Gallup. Surveys over the years ask, can you be a good Catholic without this, without obeying the church hierarchy's teaching regarding abortion? In 1987, 39% agreed, yes, you can be a good Catholic without agreeing with the church's teaching in abortion, 2005, 58%. So you go from 39, saying you can dissent, to 58, saying you can dissent. How about teaching on divorce and marriage? 1987, 57%. 2005, 66%. Without their marriage being approved by the Catholic Church, 1987, 51, said you can dissent. 2005, 67, say you can dissent. Without obeying the church's hierarchy's teaching on birth control, 66% said yes. 2005, 75. There's a trend. In the 1974 survey, 29% of Catholics thought it would be a good thing if women were allowed to be priests. 1985, 47% of Catholics. 1992, 67% of Catholics. We're seeing a trend. 
the situation comes into clear focus, when the answers, we break them down by the ages of the respondents. We'll be done with all these stats in just a minute. 2005, longitudinal study of pre-Vatican II Catholics. These were ages 65 and older in 2005. Vatican II Catholics, those were 45 to 64 in 2005. Post-Vatican II Catholics, 26 to 44 in 2005. And millennial Catholics, ages 18 to 25 in 2005. So they did a longitudinal study. The Catholics were asked to respond to this statement. You can be a good Catholic without attending Mass every week. Now, there's a complicated statement. We're talking about a commandment here. Can you be a good Catholic without attending Mass every week? The ones that agree, pre-Vatican II Catholics, 69% say yes. Post-Vatican II Catholics, 76% say yes. Millennials, 95% say yes. These are statistically significant, but, I mean, it's, it, you know, you, you don't know whether to do a jaw drop or whatever. That 95% say, I can be a good Catholic and not go to Mass every week. Okay? Next one. Individuals, as opposed to church hierarchy, have the final say on abortion. Pre-Vatican II Catholics, 31% say yes. Post-Vatican II Catholics, 44. Millennials, 77. Catholicism contains a greater share of truth than other religions do. Pre-Vatican II Catholics, 61% think so. Millennials, 44%. Now, in another survey they did around college, um, on college millennials, only 19% agree that, that Catholicism contains a greater share of truth than other religions do. These college millennials are the people that, in theory at least, would be the leading tier huh, of future Catholics intellectually, right? But they're not Catholic. On abortion, 1987, 42% of pre-Vatican II Catholics saw the final moral authority in church leaders. 24% of post-Vatican II Catholics saw final moral authority in church leaders. That's 87. 2005, pre-Vatican II Catholics go from 42 to 33%. Post-Vatican II Catholics go from 24 to 19%. On uh, perverted behaviors, pre-Vatican II Catholics in 1987, 46%. In 2005, 33%. Post-Vatican II Catholics in 87, 26%, uh, 19% in 2005. On non-marital sex, in 1987, 47% of pre-Vatican II Catholics saw final moral authority in church leaders. In 2005, it was 30%. In 1987, 23% of post-Vatican II Catholics saw authority in church leaders. In 2005, 21%. Last statistic. In 2005, 43% of pre-Vatican II Catholics said they have a high commitment to the Catholic Church. 17% of post-Vatican II Catholics said that they have a high commitment to the Catholic Church. And amazingly, 0% of millennial Catholics said they have a high commitment to the Catholic Church. Conclusions. Again, even if we grant a generous margin of error to these results, we can still characterize them as being symptomatic of a profound and growing apostasy and a growing descent. It hasn't slowed down. It continues to grow. A growing descent from infallible teachings, especially the moral teachings that are infallible of the church amongst Catholics in the pews. The authors write, quote, Catholics have increasingly seen authority in their individual conscience while the acceptance of church leaders as the locus locus of moral authority declines. No kidding. The authors say because older Catholics have higher commitment than young adults, one cannot expect any increase in high commitment Catholics in the near future. And as New Oxford View points out, what an understatement. We're done with the New Oxford View. Two very important points to meditate on briefly. The first point, inside the church, In the pews, the classrooms, certainly in the pulpits, there seems to be an absolutely astronomical level of what I call graduates of the Jiminy Cricket School of Moral Theology. By that I mean people that say, well, let your conscience be your guide. That's the rule. Just let your conscience be your guide, and they run around singing like Jiminy Cricket to Pinocchio. That's fine and true as long as your conscience is conformed to reality, to the natural law and the divine laws of God, okay? Then it's, that's true. What, but if we can conform our conscience, another way of saying that is we have to take every effort to conform our conscience to the teachings of Holy Mother Church. 
God set up the church precisely so we know and can know without any shadow of a doubt what we must do and what we must avoid in order to obtain eternal life. When we were baptized, God gave us this new kind of life, supernatural life. He placed it into our souls when we were born. And what this life does is it gives us the ability to get to heaven and to live there when we die. By our own nature, we can neither get to heaven nor can we live there. Heaven is completely inaccessible to us as mankind. It is completely inaccessible. You point out, if we want to go down and look at a coral reef, 200 feet under the water, or 150 feet or whatever, we can do that. Not of our own nature you can't get down there, but we can use technology, you know, a diving bell, scuba tanks, a submarine. There's different things that we could go down and spend time tootling around 150 feet under the water, huh? Not of our own nature, but we can get build technology for it, rent it or something. There's no possible amount of technology, research, money. There is no way to get to heaven from here of our own means. It's completely totally and absolutely beyond our ability as men to get to heaven. It requires powers that are beyond our natural powers, supernatural powers. That's what God gave us when we're baptized. And if we die with this supernatural life, we'll go to heaven. We might have a little summer school in purgatory for a while, but we're going to get to heaven. If we die without it, we can't go to heaven, which means we have to go to hell. There's no other chances, okay? Naturally speaking, there's no way to go to heaven. All right, now, what does it have to do with the moral law? Christ established the Catholic Church in order to give us the supernatural life. He wants to make sure we die having that supernatural life. We'll be judged on the question, do we have that supernatural life? It's called sanctifying grace. It means being the state of grace. If the answer is yes, we die with it, we'll be saved. If the answer is no, we die without it, we'll be damned. What does this have to do with the moral law? Everything. In order to understand it, let's consider our natural life. Suppose you go over to somebody's house and they got the wood stove all fired up and it's red hot. And you stand there talking and you back into it. How long are you going to sit there leaning against the wood stove? Only as long as it takes for you to jump away from it. And if you haven't done that, you know, you can imagine it. But everybody that's done that, you know, I mean, you're going to move and you're going to move fast. Why? God gave us pain receptors. The purpose of pain receptors is to tell us. Wait a minute, you're getting in trouble, you're about to injure yourself. It's to protect our natural life. If we didn't have pain receptors, we might lean up against that wood stove and wonder, what's that burning smell of flesh, you know, until you notice your clothes on fire and you're, why? We wouldn't know. He's given that to us so that we can protect ourselves or we know when we're injured and we need help. Here's the thing with supernatural life. It's completely beyond our nature. You can't smell it. You can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't touch it. You can't hear it. There is no way of being able to sensibly tell whether you have this life, what condition it's in, what hurts it, and what doesn't hurt it. God had to let us know. He wants us to get to heaven. We have to have this. It's beyond our powers. So he gives us a conscience. So we already know the natural law. You can't get things on the natural law wrong for very long. Some things you can get wrong, but not most of them. All these politically correct perversions, they know. That's why they make these different laws calling phobia this and phobia that because they don't want us to remind them because their consciences are in a bad way. You can whistle past the graveyard all you want, but if you're really scared of it and somebody says, boo, it's going to hurt. And that's what they're worried about with all these phobia laws. Anyway, so we have a conscience, but we also have to know what are the things that will harm our supernatural life. So God has given us these moral teachings. If you stay inside these boundaries, your life will grow. If you go outside them, They'll either be injured, that's a venial sin, or it's it's supernatural suicide, that's a mortal sin. Now, God is so merciful that we could do all kinds of knuckle-handed, objectively wrong things, but if we don't know, he never holds it against us. As long as we don't know, and it's a legitimate I don't know, but I'm, and not a, well, I don't want to find out, and I think it's probably wrong, and I'll do it anyway. But a legitimate I don't know, invincible ignorance, he doesn't hold that against us. He won't take supernatural life away. But when we commit a mortal sin... Remember that's seriously wrong. We knew it's wrong. We do it anyway. That is supernatural suicide. It destroys that life in us. So the moral law is a gift from God that he delivers to us for the same reason he gave us supernatural life. I love you so much. I'm going to give you this chance to go to heaven, and I'm going to tell you where the trail is. Don't go crawl through these fences, and you'll get to heaven. It's a gift. 
It's a gift. He's not hassling us. He's not trying to take away our fun. He's trying to make sure that we're happy in this life and the next, that we don't have a guilty conscience in this life and we see him for, and we're happy with him forever in the next, that we stay out of trouble in this life and we don't burn in the next. That's what the moral law is, okay? So if we reject it, we're rejecting the only roadmap to heaven and choosing destruction and the path to hell. That's if we reject it deliberately. Again, God's mercy himself, so if we don't know any better, we don't suspect we may be wrong, no harm. So, to go back to it, what do we mean by the Jiminy Cricket School of Moral Theology? Then we mean people who just simply and consciously decide to pick and choose right and wrong instead of conforming themselves to the teaching of the church. They say things like, well, I'm an adult. I can form my own conscience. After all, it's my choice. I mean, I'm sure you've encountered it. Priests do all the time. When you go to a bus depot, when you when you go to a, a, an airport or something, you can be guaranteed that they're going to come up and somebody's going to have an issue and, and they'll start talking about things. And what, you know, they just don't... And then when you tell them the truth, I mean, you try to do it as gently as possible. I know I'm from Montana. I don't have a lot of class in some of this, you know, but you try to tell them gently, well, you know, look, if you do that, you'll go to hell. I mean, you don't necessarily say that. But they, they're happy if you tell them what they want to hear, but they're not happy if you tell them the truth. It's a disaster. This is the Jiminy Cricket School of Moral Theology. Somebody needs to squish this crooked. And it's the oldest lie in the book. Open it up. The devil starts talking to Eve, and he's asked what God told her. As soon as she says that, if we, you know, about dying the death, he says, "You will not die the death. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." In other words, no, you're not going to lose your state of grace. You're not going to lose that supernatural life God gave you. You won't die, supernaturally speaking, even if you commit this mortal sin. You will be like God. You get to decide what's right and wrong. The locus of a moral authority is in your conscience. You decide. It's your choice. That's literally the oldest line in the book. Literally. Literally. It's in the third chapter of Genesis. It's the first word, the first lie out of the devil's lips that we have a record of right there. And it's only a few hours into, into the creation of man. Okay, We have some notices here, though, for people that haven't noticed. God reserves to himself the right to decide what's right and wrong. This idea, as expressed by the, the people that did the research and then analyzed it, the Gallup poll did it for them, but then they analyzed this idea that they notice that Catholics are increasingly seeing authority in individual con- consciences, while the acceptance of church leaders as a locus of more authority declines is literally a lie from hell. I'm not being rhetorical. That's literally what it is. Literally. The individual is not the center of the moral universe. God is. God is. Second point. If there's one thing these statistics demonstrate, and I don't say this with any delight at all, we have lost the younger generation. The jury's in. The faith has not been passed on, pure, plain, and simple. In the greater church, we've lost the younger generation. We've lost them. It's not just true here. I've got a lot of friends in the fraternity over in Australia. There are virtually the people that practice that are young are either from Malta or they're Maltese, they're ethnic thing, or they're from Lebanon. That's about it. The, Austra- the native Australian young people, they have checked out. They've been baptized, confirmed, and they go to the bar or the beach or whatever it is. They got no time. For the church, they've left. You still have some ethnic uh, people that have a very strong ethnic identity, thanks be to God, and they're going, and that's it. And this is even in the traditionalists over there. It's unbelievable. All right. Let's turn to signs of the times in our society. Sign. Divorce rate. According to surveys done in 2004 by the Barna Group, this is a... Uh, Evangelical Protestant Research Organization, 46% of all married baby boomers have already divorced. 33% of the married couples of the previous two generations divorced. Catholics are substantially less likely to divorce than Protestants, with 25% of married Catholics divorcing as compared to 39% of Protestants. Among married born-again Protestants, 35% have divorced, which is exactly the same percentage as found in married adults who are not born again. 
23% of born-again Protestants get divorced two or more times. Among Protestants, the most likely to get divorced are Pentecostals, who have a 44% divorce rate. And it's greater in the Bible Belt than up north. That's interesting, too. Anyway, Barna said that there's no end in sight regarding this problem. Quote, you can understand why atheists and agnostics might have a high rate of divorce, since they are less likely to believe in concepts such as sin, absolute moral truth, and judgment. Yet the survey found that the percentage of atheists and agnostics who have been married divorced is 37%, very similar to the numbers for the born-again population. Given the current growth in the numbers of atheists and agnostics and that the younger two generations are predisposed to divorce, we do not anticipate a reversal of the present pattern within the next decade. Close quote. Sign. In the U.S., cohabitation is up 1,000% since 1960. Forty percent of our children now spend some of their childhood living with a cohabitating couple. The proportion of children now living with their married parents dropped from 85 percent in 1975 to less than 70 percent today. Sign. In the early 1960s, 8 percent of all United States children were born out of wedlock. As of 2002, 33.8 percent of all children were born out of wedlock. Sign the birth rate. The birth rate here in the U.S. has dropped to the lowest level since national data have been available. It's down a full 17% since 1990. Sign. According to the CDC, that's the U.S. Center for Disease Control, in 1965, 16% of married women of childbearing age in the U.S. were surgically sterilized. In 1995, percentage was 41%. From 16% to 41% now. It was 12 years ago. Sign. According to the CDC, listen to this one. And I just was, I was on the website this morning. According to the CDC, 98% of women who have ever had relations have used at least one method of contraception. About 82% of women have used the pill at some time in their lives. Sign. Here's one I was just throwing out there. What percentage of physicians refuse to prescribe birth control? How many physicians here in Kansas City? Refuse to prescribe birth control. How many Catholic physicians in Kansas City? What percentage of physicians in the Catholic hospitals here in Kansas City refuse to prescribe birth control? Sign, 95% of all abortions are chosen as a method of birth control. 95%. It's emergency contraception. 95%. The remaining 5% result of other things. Nearly all, now I'll read you something. This is from Alan Gutmark Institute. I'm reading from Planned Parenthood, their research arm. So it's, this is from the enemy. Nearly all of the, of the, this is in 1995. Nearly all of the 1.3 million abortions a year are done because a woman did not want to be pregnant at that particular time. The majority of women undergoing abortion give one or more of the following reasons. Number one, number one reason, a baby would interfere with work, school, or other responsibilities. That's 75% of abortions. Number two, they can't afford to have a child, 66%. Number three, they don't want to be a single parent or have problems in their relationship. Only 1% of women aborting say they've been advised that there's a defect. Only 1% say they become pregnant by some crime. It's not in their interest to report this stuff. Sign, pornography. As of four years ago, U.S. porn revenue exceeds the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. The three major networks make about $6.2 billion. Porn revenue is larger than all the combined revenues of professional football, baseball, and basketball, all the franchises. The porn industry, according to conservative estimates four years ago, brought in $57 billion dollars worldwide, in which the U.S. was responsible for $12 billion. So the United States, $12 billion four years ago in porn. There were 800 million rentals of porn uh, DVDs and videos. 800 million rentals. 800 million. 70 percent, I'm quoting from Bishop Finn's letter here, 70 percent of 18 to 24-year-old men visit porn sites in a typical month. 66 percent of men in their 20s and 30s report being regular users of porn. 90 percent 
90% of 8 to 16-year-olds using the Internet have viewed porn online most while doing their homework. Parents, you'll answer for that if it's happening in your home. 11-year-old is the average age of the first Internet exposure to pornography as of 2004. 11. 11. What is that doing to these young people? 11 years old. Sign. In the U.S., by the age of 19, 70% of boys and 46% of girls have lost their virginity. Sign the new forms of marriage, the decriminalization and normalization of various perversions that are unnameable. Sign pro-pervert legislation and brainwashing. This, I'll read you excerpts from an article on World Net Daily October 13th of this past year. October 13th, 2007. Mom and dad, the terms, as well as husband and wife, the terms, have been banned from California schools under a bill signed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who probably was going to communion that weekend. You know, he's Catholic. On a bill signed by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who with his signature also ordered public schools to allow boys to use girls' restrooms and locker rooms and vice versa if they chose. The bill signed includes Senate Bill 777, which should be 666. It bans anything in public schools that could be interpreted as negative towards perversions, perversions, and other lifestyle choices of an alternate type. There are no similar protections for students with traditional or conservative lifestyles and beliefs, however. Also signed was Assembly Bill 394, which targets parents and teachers for such indoctrination through anti-harassment training. From now on, on a banned list will be any text, reference, or teaching aid that portrays marriage as only between a man and a woman. Materials that say that people are born male or female. I mean, I know, you know, you don't want to laugh, but where do they dream this up? Uh, not in between. Sources that fail to include a variety of perverted perverted and perverted historical figures and other perverted things. I just have to skip that. Furthermore, homecoming kings and homecoming queens, fill in the blank. Assembly Bill 394 promotes the same issues through state-funded publication, postings, curricula, and handouts to students, parents, and teachers. It also creates a circumstance where a parent who says marriage is only for a man and a woman in the presence of a teacher with a certain orientation could be convicted of harassment, and a student who believes people are born either male or female could be reported as a harasser by teachers suffering from another one of these perversions. Schwarzenegger also signed Assembly Bill 14. It doesn't end, huh? It, prevents, it prohibits state funding for any program that does not support a range of alternative sexual practices, including state-funded social services run by churches. Affected would be daycares, preschool or after-school programs, food and housing programs, senior circuses, anti-gang efforts, job programs, and others. It also forces every hospital in California, even private religious hospitals, to adopt policies in support of perversions, perversions, and perversions. And opens up nonprofit organizations to lawsuits if they exclude members that engage in perverted, perverted, or perverted conduct. Sign. This whole over-the-top, earth-worship, extreme environmentalist, the deep green uh, movement, it's coupled so often with a hatred uh, for mankind. And I could talk at this for great length. I haven't encountered as much of it here. It's certainly a problem at home because of where I'm from. Uh, but there's a hatred of mankind, and it seems the focus seems to be towards darker types of mankind, especially those that live in poverty or don't travel in the right social classes. Okay, to cite one example out of dozens, and I picked this because she writes for a newspaper over there, uh, the National Catholic Reporter. Her name's Rosemary Radford Reuther, an eco-feminist. Uh, they call her a theologian. I'm sorry, that's absolutely wrong. She said in May 1998 at an ecological conference, quote, we need to seek the most compassionate way of weeding out people. In place of the pro-life movement, in place of the pro-life movement, we need to develop the spirituality of recycling. A spirituality that includes ourselves in the renewal of earth and self. We need to compost ourselves. Why don't these people ever take their own advice? Why has it always got to be people like us that are expected to compost ourselves? Several months later, she told the National Conference of Call to Action, a dissident Catholic organization, well, a dissident organization, how much people must go on the compost pile. We must return to the population level of 1930. That's about 2 billion people. 
What is discreetly unannounced is what to do with the 14 billion surplus people, or the 4 billion surplus people, excuse me. So 2 billion, I want the other two-thirds, I want you off my planet by sundown. Sign, the New Age Movement. Lee Penn, he's a convert from Marxism to Byzantine Catholicism. He's done outstanding work in tracking and recording the religious viewpoints of followers of the New Age movement. These are beliefs that are subscribed to by many influential men and women at upper echelons of power and politics, the United Nations, the environmental movement, academia, the media, and big business. Lee Penn summarizes these New Age views. Quote, many Christians view the New Age movement as merely self-indulgent silliness. Unfortunately, there's far more substance to New Age beliefs than astrology, crystals, weird workshops, and psychobabble. New Age spiritual leaders have a firmly entrenched anti-Christian worldview and harbor special hatred for the Catholic Church. They believe that the fall was really humanity's ascent into knowledge, assisted by Lucifer, whom they hail as the bringer of light and wisdom. They expect an imminent apocalyptic transformation that will lead humanity into the New Age. By acts of men or by an act of spirit, Earth will be cleansed of those who refuse to evolve. In the New Age, there will be world government. The economy will be made, remade to promote sharing. Traditional morality and traditional families will disappear. Orthodox religions, especially Christianity and Judaism, are separative and obsolete. In the New Age, they too will vanish. Close quote. Sign. Federal Appeals Court. Detmer versus Landon. In 1986, found that witchcraft is a constitutionally recognized religion with the same rights and protections that other religions enjoy. 1986. The last sign, this pertains to Italy. It's the only country for which I could find these statistics. Since these are Italian statistics, Italy's a Catholic country, and the United States is certainly not, never has been. These statistics can't translate directly into our experience in the U.S., but they're indicative. They can give us some idea of our own situation here in the States, okay? In the year 2000, there were 167 exorcists working in Italy. In that year, those 167 exorcists had 500,000 requests for assistance from troubled people. Okay. Many of those probably had other troubles. We don't know the exact percent, but many of them indeed did have Problems with a demon. Okay, let's stop and back up and remind ourselves of what we're doing here. We started by talking about moon dogs and sun dogs. These are signs in the sky by which, at least uh, back home, we can predict the weather. We noted that our Lord explicitly spoke of predicting the weather by reading the signs, and not only that, He actually castigated the Jews for not for being able to read the signs in the heavens but not being able to read the signs of the times. We've just spent the past few minutes considering a few of the signs of the times, some of the signs in the church, and some of the signs in our society. Now let's spend a few minutes considering what those signs ought to mean to each one of us, okay? Let's start by considering the general trends. Inside the church, we've seen a rejection of the moral authority of the church, even by those who consider themselves Catholic. We've seen an assuming of the spirit of personal autonomy with authority supposedly vested in individual consciences, and there's a corresponding rejection of the teaching authority of the church, a corresponding rejection of the teaching authority of our Holy Father, the Pope, which means a corresponding rejection of the teaching authority of Christ our Lord. We've seen that at least in the wider circles of the Catholic Church, we've lost the younger generation. They're gone. They're gone. Outside the church, what have we seen? The collapse of the stable two-parent family. Skyrocketing divorce rates, shacking up, becoming a norm, numbers of children born out of redlock, skyrocketing, all accompanied by declining birth rates, a collapse of sexual morality, an unbelievable number of women sterilized, Virtually universal use of contraception, at least at some time in a relationship. We've seen 95% of the abortions performed in our country every year are really acts of emergency contraception, so-called. Virginity among teenagers is becoming rare and rare. Porn is through the roof, as are perversions. And now, 
this is significant, where the California legislation were beginning to see the state use force to promote perverse behaviors in the public school system. We're now seeing the state positively promote one of the four sins that cry out to heaven for vengeance. For those of you that might not realize this, in 2005, the Ninth Circuit Court found that the right of parents to train, educate, and place moral restraints upon their children, quote, does not extend beyond the threshold of the school door, close quote. That ought to put this latest stunt in California that we talked about from the pulpit in a little finer focus, too. We've noticed the upsurge in environmentalism. It's an essentially religious point of view. The assumption that the earth is overpopulated, that's a denial of the providence of God right on the face of it. But people from that point of view want two-thirds of humanity to get lost. We've seen that New Agers have a firm antichrist outlook, a special hatred for Catholicism, and that they treat Lucifer... They treat Lucifer as a bearer of light and wisdom. They're expecting an apocalyptic transformation to cleanse the earth of people that won't evolve. That means people like us, by the way. When they say people that won't evolve, we won't get the new ideas. That's our problem. We're stuck. We have to move past people like us. We've seen that for over 20 years, federal courts have recognized witchcraft as a constitutionally protected religion, at least in Italy. Absolutely incredible numbers of people are suffering from demonic Oppression, obsession, and possession. Okay, so those are some of the signs of times. So what are we talking? These are all signs of an emerging worldview. We're seeing a cultural convergence here. We're seeing all kinds of different strains coming together in our culture. This is the signs of an emerging worldview. And by worldview, what we mean is a certain way of approaching reality, a certain common way of understanding the world around us. These signs all flow for, into this worldview. Okay? For the rest of this conference, we're going to try to get a clear hand on this emerging worldview. In order to do that, we'll start by posing a question in biblical terms. First, we'll read a passage from the inspired and inerrant word of God. Then we'll take a moment to make sure we understand clearly the passage, what it's saying, and then we'll pose the question, okay? We'll read a passage, explain it, pose a question. The passage is taken from the fifth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. Please listen carefully. St. Paul, quote, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are fornication, uncleanness, immodesty, luxury, idolatry, witchcraft, enmities, contentions, jealousies, anger, quarrels, dissensions, sects, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and such like, of which I foretell you, as I have foretold you, that they who do such things shall not obtain the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, long-suffering, mildness, faith, modesty, continence, Chastity. Against such there is no law. And they that are of Christ's have crucified their flesh with the vices and the concupiscences. Close quote. Let's take a moment to make sure we understand the passage. St. Paul lists two series of behaviors. He describes the work of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. By the fruits of the Spirit, he means actions done by men who are guided by the Holy Spirit. Here's that list again. The fruits of the Spirit. Charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, long-suffering, mildness, faith, modesty, continence, chastity. That's the fruits of the Spirit. By works of the flesh, he means actions that are done by men that are not guided by the Holy Spirit. That only leaves two possibilities. They're either guided by the fallen human spirit... That's one possibility. Or they're guided by evil spirits. That's the other possibility. And in any event, 
someone that's being guided by a fallen human spirit ends up being guided by the evil spirit. So the final results are the same. Here's that list again. Fornication, uncleanness, immodesty, luxury, idolatry, witchcraft, enmity, contentions, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, sects, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and such like. Okay, now that we can all see the meaning of the passage, let's pose the question. We've looked at the signs of the times. So which spirit is leading our society? Is our society characterized by charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, long-suffering, Mildness, faith, modesty, continence, and chastity? Or is our society characterized by fornication, uncleanness, immodesty, luxury, idolatry, witchcraft, enmity, contentions, jealousies, anger, quarrels, dissensions, sects, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and such life? Which spirit is leading our society? Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it the spirits behind the works of flesh, the fallen human spirit and ultimately behind the fallen human spirit, the demonic spirits? Well, no one can seriously claim that our society is guided by the Holy Spirit. In fact, that would be the height of blasphemy to make a claim like that. If we want to read the signs of the times, and we'll get to the forecast in a few minutes, if we want to read the signs of the times, the signs tell us one thing. As a culture, we're not only not fighting our disordered desires, we're not fighting the weaknesses to which our fallen human nature is prone, but we're positively embracing these disordered desires. And that means one thing. It means that the spirits that lead our society ultimately are evil spirits. The spirits guiding our society are evil spirits. It's essential to understand, as a culture, we've rejected the light of Christ. And whereas light doesn't shine, there's only darkness. And it's real darkness. When people refuse the light of Christ, when they refuse the help of grace, for example, when people refuse to follow the natural law, which is written in every man's heart, he understands it at a fundamental level, and go home and read the first chapter of Romans, verses 18 to the end. It's 18 lines. Romans 1, 18 to the end, okay? When people refuse to follow the light of the natural law that's written into our very nature by our loving Creator, when they refuse to follow the natural law, for example, by embracing a perverted lifestyle, embracing abortion, embracing fanticide, when people refuse to follow the natural law, then they place themselves under the guidance of evil spirits, whether they know it or not. Obviously, most people that are involved in sinful and heinous behavior act out of weakness and not malice. Nevertheless, as long as they don't struggle, they're embracing the darkness. That's when they reject the natural law. If they know when they reject the divine law, that's even more grave because they understand it. No one can run away from natural law. Many people don't, don't, don't know the divine law. There's a difference. Once we understand that, it's easy to understand something. We can see this cultural convergence we're seeing, this cultural convergence that's happening right before our eyes, is simply a result of evil intelligences who have been patiently preparing, guiding and channeling different cultural streams and movements, slowly coordinating this emerging worldview over time. They never sleep. They never sleep. And when evil spirits gain control over society, religiously speaking, what does that become? It's an easy question to answer. We'll answer it with scripture and history. History, historically speaking, except of any of us here have Hebrew blood, before the conversion of our ancestors to Catholicism, into what religious category would we place all our ancestors? They're all pagans. We're all descended from pagans unless we have Hebrew blood. Is that the same as saying 
that our ancestors were guided by evil spirits? Yes, it is. Here's a proof text. Psalm 95.5 says, All the gods of the Gentiles are demons. Period. Inerrant word of God. God clearly teaches that all gods of Gentiles, that's our ancestors, the pagan nations, were demons. When evil spirits gain control of a culture, it always becomes pagan. When evil spirits gain control of a culture, it always becomes pagan. So what are we seeing when we see the signs of the times? We're seeing signs of the increased paganization of a culture inside the general circles of the Catholic laity, religious, priests, and outside the church and the general society. We're seeing the paganization of the church and society. We have front row seats to watch a society become pagan right before our eyes, and it's happening fast. A culture of death is essentially a pagan culture. It may not be explicit, but it's essential. When the Holy Father, the previous Holy Father, talked about a culture of death, that was a kind and gentle and pastoral way to talk about pagan culture invading and conquering Christian culture. Now, before we make predictions of upcoming events, let's spend a few minutes taking a closer look at the beliefs of people in our culture, right here in our society, who have already explicitly rejected Christ and embraced paganism. So we're not talking about somebody that comes from the mountains in Nepal and has been pagan all the way back since they got off the ark. That's not what we're talking about right here. We're talking about people that may very well have been baptized and have turned away from that and embraced paganism, okay? There's one problem. The problem with describing modern paganism, it's sort of, describing it sort of like trying to pin down tomato seeds on a plate. Every time you start pushing down on it, they got, think you got the blast thing pinned down. It squirts out from under your finger, okay? So, we'll have to be general here. We'll follow the works of Brooks Alexander right here. Brooks Alexander is a very astute uh, observer. He's a convert to evangelical Protestantism from the counterculture himself. He actually had the work I'm referring to here vetted by witches and other neo-pagans to make sure he was treating their beliefs and attitudes uh, accurately, okay? They didn't agree with his assessment, obviously, because we're coming from opposing teams, but to make sure that, that it's not, I'm not... In other words, I'm not pulling some wacko uh, preacher man type thing out of who knows where, okay? It's, this isn't a comic book. So we'll start by making some basic distinctions just so we have our terminology right. Think of three concentric circles. A small circle surrounded by a medium circle surrounded by a, a larger circle, okay? The small circle is Wicca. Now, Wicca, strictly speaking, is a religion invented in the late 40s and early 50s by an Englishman named Gerald Gardner. The, okay, that's Wicca. The medium circle is witchcraft. Witchcraft includes Wiccans. Those are people that follow Gerald Gardner, strictly speaking, and people who call themselves witches but do not follow Gardner's teachings. The largest circle is neo-paganism. That includes Wiccans and witches, but it also includes other groups and individuals that follow other strange occult things, Druids, Norse gods, Roman gods, Greek gods, pagan things. The broadest term is neo-paganism. Uh, the, the narrowest term is Wiccan, which is, is, is medium. Okay, All Wiccans and witches are neo-pagans, but not all neo-pagans are witches. Okay. Now that we have some terminology, let's try to pin down their belief. Again, because these are basically anarchical religions based for the most part on feelings rather than truth, it's sort of like trying to pin down a tomato seed. That being said, we'll try to summarize five basic attitudes of neo-pagans. Again, we'll follow Brooks Alexander's work closely. Number one, modern pagans, neo-pagans, find their identity in a difference from in opposition to both Christianity and the culture that flows from it. They have this fundamental attitude of an explicit rejection of Christ coupled with an attitude of cultural insurrection. So the first attitude, they have an oppositional identity. It's based on explicit rejection of Christ and Christian culture and mores and a corresponding attitude of cultural insurrection. Second, modern pagans, neo-pagans, subscribe to animism, polytheism, and pantheism. You're probably already going, what do you mean? Those sound contradictory. I'll explain. And again, this it's funny. What does that mean? Animism, polytheism, pantheism are basic religious attitudes in neo-paganism. All right, let's see. Animism. By that, they see a spiritual life force in all things. 
In other words, not only we and the animals and the plants alive, but the rocks and the minerals alive, the stars are alive, you know, all these things are alive, okay? So it's like the Gaia hypothesis, if you're talking about deep green ecology, that the whole earth is alive. Okay, this this sort of thing. So you know you can hurt ro- you know rocks and so forth. Polytheism, as the word indicates, indicates a belief in more than one god, a belief in many gods and goddesses. It's direct opposition to monotheism. However, in spite of this belief in many gods and goddesses, they still believe in this basic divinity. I'll put that in quotes that underlies all things. It pervades nature. It's like a substrate of nature. It's the force, Luke. So it's underneath everything, okay? This is where the pantheism comes in. The universe is alive with this energy of consciousness and that that's the divine. And everything is made of this divinity at the fundamental level, okay? That also implies that since everything in nature is filled with this divine energy, the nature itself is holy, which leads to the whole environmentalist, earth-based, nature religion aspect, the importance of the seasons and all, all that sort of thing in, 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 within neo-paganism. Also, since the divine is hidden in nature, it can be uncovered. Since the divine is hidden in nature, it can be uncovered. Someone can tap into that power. They can recognize their divinity. They can become enlightened. They can become empowered. They can manipulate that energy by means of rituals. That's what we mean by magic and sorcery. That's the principle underlying their understanding of magic and sorcery. One of my converted friends, I have friends that have converted from this, at a certain point in his, in his witchcraft, he's a Wiccan, there would be a demon show up. You know, he's got the altar in, in, in the middle of this pentagram. There would be a demon show up. And he said it's kind of chalky, see-through, whitish, chalky-looking thing, sitting there and scary-looking. And he says, I know it sounds funny now, by now, but I didn't think it was a demon from hell. I didn't believe in hell. I was tapping into nature, and this is something from another plane. So you don't mess with it, you back away. Okay, anyway... The magic, they're tapping into this power, and they don't even know where the powers come from. They're doing these kind of rituals, huh? It's really important. A young person told me recently that's been quite involved in this stuff, well, Christians pray, but they do rituals. Hold that thought. We'll return to that later. Christians pray, but they do rituals. Okay, anyway, second basic attitude is this belief in animism, seeing the spiritual life force in all things, polytheism, a worship of many gods or goddesses, and pantheism, that belief that under everything in the universe, it's alive with this energy of consciousness. That's the divine, and it's the substrate of, of all being, okay? This belief leads into nature worship, the quest for empowerment, the quest to manipulate this power by means of magic rituals. Third, modern pagans, neo-pagans, Embrace feminism. Neo-paganism is strongly female-centered and goddess-oriented. There's reasons for this historically certain with Wicca, because Gardner had this for different reasons. I don't want to develop all that. We don't have times to pursue it. It's very interesting. This is one of the reasons there's so much Sophia worship and witchcraft and female religious orders in the United States. The congregations are really infected. I'm totally serious. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. I was talking to a priest about three weeks ago that was talking about saying Mass for the Wiccans. What are you talking about? And he's talking about this convent. You're like, you know, anyway, you can fill in the rest. Right? The third basic religious attitude is an embrace of feminism. Four, modern pagans or neo-pagans deny the reality of sin. In their universe, there is no such thing as sin. This is essential for us to understand. Quote, the specific Christian beliefs most often targeted for denial of and repudiation by neo-pagans are the concept of sin and the uniqueness of Christ. This almost visceral rejection seems to be one of the few genuine universals of the modern witchcraft movement, and it appears to hold true across the neo-pagan spectrum. Close quote. The fourth basic religious attitude is there's no such thing as sin. But anyone that explicitly rejects sin must also logically reject the need for a savior. If there's no such thing as sin, we don't need to be saved from anything. Now, I'll use one of their monuments, so to speak. I'll quote you some verses from a pagan song, a popular pagan song, if we can use that terminology. I mean, most of the music we on the radio is popular pagan songs, but this one is really pagan. Just a couple verses. I once was found 
but now I'm gone, away from the faithful fold. Of those that preach that holiness is to do as you are told. The law and scripture preach and pair have all instructed me. My skin, my bones, my heretic heart are my authority. Pause. This, I'm, I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. This is a poem that expresses the same attitude that we saw with the Catholic religious teachers and the attitudes in the pews. This personal autonomy comes from me. It's the same thing. Continuing. Now they tell me Jesus loves me, but I think that he loves in vain. He must go unrequited. On me he has no claim. I can hardly read that. It makes your hair stand up. My goddess is Our Lady Moon, whose tides run deep in me. My skin, my bones, my heretic heart are my authority. And while I bleed this glorious air, an outlaw all remain. My body will not be subdued, and I will not be saved. And if I cannot shout it loud, I'll sing it secretly. My skin, my bones, my heretic heart are my authority. There you get this rejection again of Christ. They're not going to be saved in this cultural opposition. I'm going to be an outlaw. Hmm? Fourth, basic religious attitude, there's no such thing as sin. Five, modern pagans or neo-pagans believe in some spiritual reciprocity. They have all kinds of different ways of expressing it, but basically what this means is what goes around comes around. Okay, that's the idea that what goes around comes around. All right? Out of, what the energy you put into the universe comes back to you. Okay? At a fundamental level, neo-pagans reject, quote, the idea that we are accountable for our behavior to a higher moral authority and a revealed moral standard. Instead, consistent with its pantheism, neo-paganism believes that ethical behavior arises naturally out of the workings of spiritual reciprocity. The idea that the energy you put in the world comes back. Close quote. The result is what I call a lame ethical system based on something called the, the Rick and Reed. This is a guideline they invented recently, probably by Gerald Gardner, but it's not very old. But they put it into Old English, so it give it some pretense of antiquity and authority. Here it is. And it harm none, do as ye will. Which means as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, do anything you will. This is not a very vigorous moral law system. Huh? So the fifth basic religious attitude of neo pagan is spiritual reciprocity. What goes around comes around. Okay? So the five, summing up, the five religious attitudes, generally speaking, first, an identity rooted in an opposition to Christianity, Christ our Lord, and the culture that flows from it. Basically, rejecting Christ and an attitude of cultural insurrection. Second, belief in animism, polytheism and pantheism. Third, uh, embrace of feminism. Fourth, rejection of the notion of sin. Fifth, this idea of spiritual reciprocity. What goes around comes around. Obviously, each one of these attitudes really res- resonates with many of the currents in our modern secular society. There's a reason for that. The source is the same. The evil geniuses, they're hiding behind these currents and these views. This stuff has been vomited up right out of the bowels of hell. Brooks Alexander has a thoughtful analysis. Quote, at every point and in every respect, Neopaganism stands in contrast and outright antagonism to the Christian understanding of reality. Neopaganism's aversion to Christianity is more than just a sociological device for carving out its religious identity. It also reflects a deep spiritual antipathy towards the moral basis of Christianity. Christianity's, to them, suffocating sense of sin and judgment, the bad news that makes the good news good. Ultimately, neo-pagans reject the good news that God has given us a Savior because they reject the bad news that we needed one to begin with. And ironically, it is this part of the religious mood and attitude that puts neo-paganism increasingly in harmony with the mood and attitude of the secular society around us, close quote. Before we go on, let's take a moment to consider a very important factor that most of us are probably blissfully unaware of, and that is the role of the Internet in the growth and spread of neo-paganism. The Internet plays approximately the same role in the subversion of our society as the clubs and the lodges played during the French Revolution. Just as the clubs and lodges provide a venue for the revolutionaries to meet 
and discuss and forward their agenda. So also the Internet provides a venue for the neo-pagan cultural revolutionaries to meet and discuss and forward their agenda. Brooks Alexander. The Internet has been central to the development of the neo-pagan movement for two reasons. First, it strengthens the hand of culturally marginal types in general by allowing people to connect together who would otherwise remain isolated from one another. I'll just make some com- You know, I knew some real oddballs growing up in Montana, but they were individual oddballs. You know, I mean, who are they, you know, whatever, buddy, you know, they could get into this stuff, but who are they going to run into? They were just out there by themselves being an oddball. You know, I mean, the people have problems wherever you are, but it's no longer true because they can connect. Second, they do so while maintaining the individual's privacy and anonymity. As one neo-pagan author notes, now here's a neo-pagan writing, prior to the advent of the Internet and World Wide Web, witches and pagans were isolated from one another. Several covens could exist in the same city or even in the same neighborhood and never even know about one another. Most witches lived their lives in a figurative bloom closet. We kept ourselves and our groups to ourselves. The net changed all that. On the web, isolated individuals and groups found one another. The web allowed community to be created where none had been. The anonymity of online communications liberated witch and folks to express their thoughts, feelings, and experiences in relative safety. So in a sense... The web became our church. Close quote. That's a neo-pagan author. Brooks Alexander. The web became our church is more than just a figure of speech. The internet functions for neo-pagans in several ways that are parallel to the way the church functions for Christians. Just as Christianity is most visible and most accessible through its churches, neo-paganism is undoubtedly most visible and accessible on the internet, as we're going to see in just a moment. It's where they find contact, interaction, edification, encouragement, and teaching. Indeed, for many witches and neo-pagans, the Internet becomes the primary means or even the sole means of fellowship with their co-religionists. Thanks to Brooks Alexander, we'll set them aside now. Let's pause for a minute to get some idea of the role of the Internet. We'll just consider one website. We've got the date on it. Two neo-pagans inaugurated this website in February 1997. When they started, they had 56 pages of content and a section of neo-pagan links and contacts. The site was an instant hit. By the end of its first year, the website had 385 pages. It had had 1,235,237 hits. It then had a list of several thousand witches, Wiccans, and pagans on its state and country pages. It listed 385 circles and events, and it had not links to 976 pagan websites. October 2003, just over six years of operation, 96 million hits. The contacts on it, 2,350 pages of text with 46,000 named contacts. They have people from all over the world, and just the links, they had 5,000 neo-pagan websites on their links. There were 7,000 links, 5,000 which neo-pagan. August 2006, after only nine years of operation, the site had received over 805 million raw hits with over 13 million unique visitors to the website as of three days ago after only 11 years of operation the site has over 140,000 registered active users and they drop out right away that's the the guy that runs it says it has about a thousand pages of content has 102,000 pagan personal listings lists almost 3,000 pagan clergy, has around 15,000 links. And in terms of neo-pagan events and gatherings, these are the events and gatherings. It has 23,000 events and gatherings. We've got an explosion, a virtual explosion in the neo-pagan world. And their beliefs are the most clear concise expression of this emerging worldview. Back to Brooks Alexander, and then we'll set him aside. Witchcraft is going mainstream. It's not a prediction, it's a description of current reality. It is a striking fact that the neo-pagan movement, spearheaded by modern witchcraft, has experienced an unbroken string of breakthroughs and successes over the last 35 years, legally, socially, and politically, in the context of the ongoing culture war, the sum of things is that neo-paganism has not been on the losing side of any major battle it has fought. It is plain that modern witchcraft's anti-Christianity is basic, 
both to its origins and its own self-image. If witchcraft is in fact good and not evil, then the system that calls it evil is evil. There is no way to escape the logic of that relationship. Modern witchcraft first found its identity in opposition to Christianity, and there is still a strong current of hostility to everything Christian that runs through the movement. There is an attitude that is widely embraced and openly encouraged within the neo-pagan community, an attitude that not only rejects the Christian message, but also blames Christian church and demonizes Christian believers. What draws and binds current cultural trends and social movements together is not their allegiance to a common agenda, but rather their common participation in a mood or attitude. The common attitude is one of rejection and refusal towards the main culture. And I want to make a parenthetical thought. They think they're countercultural. I am speaking to the counterculture right now. We are the counterculture. The common attitude is one of rejection and refusal towards the main culture, and especially towards its Christian-based concept of moral and spiritual limits. That gut-level energy of cultural change is one of the things that is fueling our culture wars in the form of social and political conflicts over such things as abortion, perversions, and cloning. All of those conflicts arise out of an indignant refusal to accept any limits at all on the right of the self to do whatever it wants in pursuit of of its own self-interest. That is the mood and temper of our times. It is the spirit of the age, zeitgeist. Today is approaching critical mass of the convergence of cultural trends, fads, and fashions. The change we are seeing around us represents a revolt by the world system, by worldly values, and by worldly people against the constraints of Christian culture. Close quotes. Okay. We've already reached the stage of essential paganism. Barring divine intervention, barring divine intervention, we will soon be living in an explicitly pagan society. For a picture of our current cultural situation, just think of an egg. Our culture is like an egg that's shaking and waiting to hatch, huh? The shell is holding back the seething mass of neo-paganism that's about to explicitly burst forth and discover its power. They don't know, and they don't realize how powerful they are yet in terms of their ideas have basically conquered. The shell is this incredibly thin veneer, and I mean thin, of what remains of an extremely weak and superficial Protestant Christian social order. It's had 500 years to fall apart since the Protestant revolt, and there's almost nothing left. A little blow. That's all it's going to take. Maybe the next election, I don't know. As we saw in the signs of the times, there isn't much there that goes for Christian social hour. They have the cultural momentum. They have the cultural momentum. They've got the momentum. Before we close, I want to submit a few quotes from modern neo-pagans for your consideration. We don't have time to develop these ideas. Um, I'm going to do my best. This first one really gets to me, so I'm going to apologize in in advance if I start crying. Before I do that, I want to give you a reading assignment because that will compose me. Another one. Read the second chapter of the Book of Wisdom. Read the last line in the first chapter and read the whole second chapter. Read from the last line in the first chapter of the Book of Wisdom through the second chapter. You'll see why. Second chapter of the Book of Wisdom and just one sentence before and then read that. It's one chapter, not that long. Read the second half of uh, the first chapter of Romans. Okay. Excerpts from an interview with a pagan priestess. This is an interview conducted by other pagans. And I'm only using excerpts. Quote, When I was a little kid growing up in a Catholic, working-class family in Whittier, Orange County, California, I had seven older brothers and sisters. I sang in a folk group at church for Saturday night mass. Sixteen was a pivotal age when everything changed in my life. In a year, 1981, 
I went from being a nice Catholic girl who obeyed all the rules to being a more punk-like, politically radical witch. I had my first intense spiritual experience when I was seven, around the time of my first communion. I was praying, and suddenly I was surrounded by light. Sorry. I could feel it and see it surrounding me, and I knew it was God. I was in the divine presence. This really affected me, and from that moment on, I've been looking for that again. She had a signal grace. God reached out to her, gave her a signal grace, and the demons were watching. It took them nine years, and they took her out. They saw it. This is someone called to be a saint and a great saint. really affected me, and from that moment on, I've been looking for that again. Question, but you haven't found it? I've found bits and pieces of it. I think those big experiences don't happen very often. This was a formative experience for me, obviously. It caused me to want direct contact. And that's one thing paganism gives me. What a lie. I'm not saying that she's lying. She, she believes that. But what a lie. The devils of God are home. Huh? And you can imagine, when somebody has these kind of gifts from God, they're going to really dogpile on her or give her special preternatural things. The devils will do special things to really distract her from that because they realize this is a soul called a great level of holiness. So we have to do something, give her an illusion so that she doesn't notice what we're up to. And we've got to get her snared in as many things as we can. I found bits and pieces of it. I think those big experiences don't happen very often. This was a formative experience for me, obviously. It caused me to want direct contact, and that's one thing paganism gives me. Paganism can give me direct contact with goddess, whatever we want to call it. Sometimes, this is sometimes called a mystical experience. Most top-down hierarchical religions don't provide this. Close quote. So here we have a Catholic girl completely lost and misled by the demons. i am certainly been praying for her. I've, I first read this interview a, a number of years ago, about four years ago, and I read it. Uh, sometimes I read it every day. Sometimes I'll go for a couple months because there's just something here. Two more quotes to consider. One prominent neo-pagan author. She, uh, she's the New York Bureau Chief for National Public Radio, so I'm confirming all your worst suspicions about NPR. She writes, quote, Religion had no official place in my childhood. I was brought up in a family of agnostics and atheists. Still feeling that there was some dimension lacking in their lives, I embarked on a quasi-religious search as a teenager. I felt ecstatic power in the Catholic Mass, as long as it was in Latin. Close quote. Last quote. Jerry Garcia, for those of you who don't know, he was the lead guitarist for the Grateful Dead. The band was originally called the Warlocks. Grew up Catholic. Here's Jerry Garcia speaking of his childhood. Quote, So one block, scarcely 100 yards from the door of our house, was God's house. In those days, they still had the wonderful Latin Mass with its resonant sonorities and mysterious ritual movements, the incense, the music, choir, organ, bells, candles, muted light through stained glass windows. Close quote, Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead. When the Latin Mass disappeared, there was this gigantic vacuum created. Gigantic vacuum, the loss, the Latin mass, the loss of Gregorian chant, mysterious rituals, incense, candles, devotions. And that vacuum was filled with mysterious rituals, incense, candles, devotions, vestments, unfortunately, all from hell. I told you to hold that thought for the young person. Christians pray, we do rituals. The collapse of Catholic devotional life the Latin Mass. See, we have 
what they're looking for. We have the answer. My friends, they're converted witches and neo-pagans. Love the old mass, the traditional liturgy. It resonates with them, huh? Back in the day, it turned the pagans into Catholics. The Latin mass turned the pagans into Catholics, and it can do it again. It hasn't lost any of its power. It's still, to use the words of Jerry Garcia, the wonderful Latin mass with its resonant sonorities and mysterious ritual movements, Incense, music, choir, organ, bells, candles, and muted light through stained glass windows. That's what it still is. Okay. Before we close, remember the story of that little boy who was scared of the water. But he had so much love and confidence in that dad that loved him. As long as dad was close by, right there watching his son, nothing really bad was going to happen. Nothing was seriously going to hurt him. That love and confidence gave that little boy the power, the ability to deal with a situation that was terrifying for him. Remember, that's what the Sacred Heart wants us to have for him. Have this profound love and trust in him. An absolute confidence in him. The realization that he's close to us. He's right here watching over us. That if he sends us across or asks us to do something that's scary, it's because he loves us. And he wants to give each one of us what we need to become saints, even if we can't see it right now. Little boy's dad wanted him to learn how to swim, so he had him do some kind of scary things and to get over his fear of water. The Sacred Heart wants us to become saints. So no matter how terrifying something might be, we want to have that profound love and confidence in him. Finally, there's one more factor to consider then. We considered by, started by considering the fact that back home, we see sun dogs and moon dogs, we can predict upcoming events in the weather. We consider the signs at times. We've seen that our society is going pagan. Our society is under the guidance of evil spirits. But we haven't considered what that means for us. What does it mean for us? We're striving to live according to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We're striving to bring forth those fruits of the Spirit. Charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, long-suffering, mildness, faith, modesty, continence, and chastity. And as we're struggling to do those things, we find ourselves living in a society that's increasingly dominated by men who've embraced the works of the flesh. They've embraced fornication, uncleanness, immodesty, luxury, idolatry, witchcrafts, enmities, contentions, jealousies, angers, quarrels, dissensions, sex, envies, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and such like. So we're striving to love God more and more, and we're embedded in a society that is controlled by the moments of fallen human nature and especially the guidance and promptings of evil spirits. And under those guidance and promptings of the evil spirit, we're embedded in a society that hates God more and more, a pagan society. So we're striving to love God more and more, and we're embedded in a society that's becoming more and more profoundly pagan. What does that mean for us? Barring divine intervention, what does it mean? means the same thing it always means. It means the same thing it always means. Every time a society becomes dominated by these kinds of men, it always means the same thing for people like us. Always. It means persecution. Shouldn't be surprised to anyone here, but it means persecution. It's not a prophecy. That is not a prophecy. Given the current cultural trends and barring divine intervention, it's not a prophecy, it's a certainty. It is a certainty. I'll just read something I have put in the bulletin sometimes, prophetic foreshadowing. Archbishop Raymond Burke of St. Louis. There's going to be a persecution, that's clear. We live, as our Holy Father says, the society of a culture of death, 
where people want to convince us that everything should be convenient and comfortable. And they don't like to hear a voice which says, this isn't right. Bishops will be persecuted, he said, and also priests and lay people. It's what it means to be a sign of contradiction. We just have to accept that. We have to remain tranquil, proclaiming the truth with charity, but insisting on the truth. If we look to the example of our Lord, we have to take up the cross for the defense of life. God loves us. He saw this day. He loves us. During the persecution of Dacius in 250 A.D., St. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, wrote some beautiful lines. He's writing about persecution during a persecution. I'll just read you some of the titles from chapters of his work. St. Cyprian, quote, Afflictions and persecutions are brought about for this purpose, that we may be tested. We must not fear the injuries and penalties of persecutions, because the protection of the Lord is greater than the assaults of the devil. And lest anyone should be frightened and troubled at the afflictions and persecutions which we suffer in this world, it was before foretold that the world would hold us in hatred, that it would arouse persecutions against us, that from this very fact that these things come to pass is manifest the truth of the divine promise in recompenses and rewards which shall afterwards follow. There is no new thing which happens to Christians, since from the beginning of the world the good have suffered and have been oppressed and slain by the unrighteous. Close quote, St. Cyprian, Bishop and Father of the Church. Let's close. Ladies and gentlemen, let's not have any illusions. We need to be serious. There are storm clouds gathering on the horizon. When you see sun dogs or moon dogs in Montana, you know it's a few days to the weather. I can't tell you how many years, if we have years. I don't know what the crystallizing event will be. But we're going to see it. It's not going to be something years and years and years down the path. These kind of aggressive movements towards school-aged children, the way they treat pro-lifers. These are just signs right now. They're gearing up. Right now, do these tortures to people. I guess it's okay as long as they speak Arabic. Must be what the average American thinks. I have no idea what they think. But the same government that will torture foreigners will not make a distinction for torturing us. I don't say that's going to happen, but we have an interesting principle at stake now. The storm clouds are gathering. We better be serious about our holy faith. Deadly serious. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Whining, complaining, feeling sorry for ourselves isn't going to change anything. God knew what he was doing. He knew when he was going to put us in history and what our circumstances were going to be. He expects us to become saints in those circumstances. In the book of Romans it says, where sin abounds, grace does abound even more. We've got rivers of sin out there. There have to be oceans of grace available for us to become saints, okay? Holiness can change everything. We need to become holy before it's too late. The rest of the mission will be concerned with just that one thing. We need to become holy. We need to become holy. Please kneel and we'll close with a prayer. Dear Lord, we beg you, look down with mercy upon us poor, weak sinners. Give us all the graces we need to be faithful, hopeful, and even cheerful as we go about doing our duty in this present darkness. Give us an absolute confidence in your love and closeness to us and an absolute trust in your Son's sacred heart. Grant that we might love you with all our heart and we may be perfectly resigned to all the trials of this life, that we may bravely resist the temptations of the enemy and grant us the grace of persevering unto the end. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you.